Hello and welcome to the Album Man and today I'm going to be carrying on with 70s Prog Week and I'm going to be doing a review of Rush's 2112. So, this is the fourth studio album from the Canadian prog band Rush and it was released in 1976 and the logo here, this Red Star logo, has pretty much become Rush's logo since then. And the band consisted of their main lineup of Geddy Lee on bass and vocals, Alex Lifeson on guitar, Neil Pert on drums. That's been their lineup for, you know, I think they had a different drum on like the first two albums, but other than that, their lineup has always remained the same. And this is one of the most famous albums, and it's considered one of their best. But the thing is, is that is this album more than just the famous song? So, this album starts off the 20 minute epic 2112, and this song is also featured on Guitar Hero Warriors of Rock, which is a very underrated game. Anyway, this song tells the story of a man living under the control of the oppressive body that is the Solar Federation and finding a guitar from the past. And it truly is a prog masterpiece. Uh, let, let me just go through the track listing of the album. 2112, A Passage to Bangkok, The Twilight Zone, Lessons, Tears, and Something for Nothing. So, um, anyway, so um, 2112 is split into seven parts, which are Overture, The Temple of Sinrix, um, Discovery, Presentation, Oracle, The Dream, Soliloquy, and Grand Finale. So, it starts out with Overture, and this is a four-minute instrumental. Musically, it's probably the best part of this song and features some really good playing all round. In the context of the overall song, this seems to really just be describing the year 2112 and it really is just an introduction to this epic song. And it does feature one line of lyrics at the end, which is, and the meek shall inherit the earth, which appears to be a direct reference to the Beatitudes of the New Testament or Psalm uh, and um, Psalm 37:11. This line seems to really, in the context, be about the wires of the Solar Federation. Musically, it's wonderful instrumental and a cracking intro to this masterpiece. And just one thing before we carry on, is do look at the back cover on this album, um, the back of the actual cover itself, as it describes the main protagonist's point of view of the world he lives on called Megadon. He says how it, he believed that, you know, what he was told, that he has a lice life and he thought he was happy before of course finding something that changed his opinion which of course is the story of this epic song. The second part is Temple of Sinrix. This talks about the priests who tell him everything that he believes and they rely on a great series of computers to micromanage and control every aspect of life from as they say, the words you read and the songs you sing. This part of the 2112, it's always a staple of Rush's live set and probably always will be. It's such a great part. Then we move into Discovery. Now this starts off the sounds of a waterfall trickling down and the gentle plucking of a guitar. This is because the protagonist, who we just called Anonymous, finds a guitar in a cave behind a waterfall. He is excited by this discovery and teaches himself how to play it. And this is so well done by Alex Lifeson as he starts out this piece with gentle open strings and quite basic stuff before progressing to a lot more complicated patterns and chords. The protagonist is then desperate to perform it to the priests who control Megadon as he believes that they will rejoice and praise his name for giving people the opportunity to make their own music. And the soft ballad style to this song really fits musically. It fits the lyrics and story so well. Then with part four, presentation, which is where the main protagonist actually performs the guitar, or plays the guitar to the priests. And the priests, they're pretty much disgusted by this instrument particularly Father Brown, who smashes the instrument to splinters beneath his feet. They say that it doesn't fit the plan and how it was just another toy that helped destroy the elder race of man. The, now, what I find so clever about this song in particular is the way that Rush distinguish between the voice of the priests and the voice of the protagonist. 
it's just genius. When the protagonist speaks, they play quieter with geddy on low pitch vocals and clean guitar. I mean, obviously it's not that low, you know, it is geddy Lee after all. And when the priests are speaking, there's very high, harsh vocals with a hard rock distorted guitar from Lifeson. And it really helps to illustrate the point of how the priests are control freaks and their oppressive regime. This is my favourite part of the song. I just love the way it's done and think it's absolute genius, lyrically and musically. Then we get to Oracle the Dream, the fifth part. And this is about the main protagonist going to sleep after having his wonderful instrument destroyed and dreaming about how great the Elder Waste must have been. He dreams that it was a place where individuality and creativity flourished and had you know, a time when there was great sculpted works of beauty from man, where man was truly allowed to express themselves instead of the priests telling them what they can and cannot do and having ultimate, complete, tyrannical control. And the protagonist realises that without these things, life is meaningless. And musically, this song it starts off slow, but as he goes to sleep, it becomes heavier as he's dreaming probably to create, to show the vividness and impact this dream has upon the protagonist. And in part six soliloquy, you can hear the waterfall sounds once again, and this is because the protagonist returns to the cave and sinks into a dark depression, wondering what m life might have been like under the Elder Ways. He then commits suicide, as he can no longer cope with living in this bleak run, in this bleak world run by the Solar Federation. Musically, it starts out slow and gentle as the protagonist just starts to ponder on his dream, but as he considers how much better life is and towards the stage where he kills himself, it gets heavier and angrier. And this epic, epic song ends with part seven, Grand Finale, which is instrumental, and this ends the song in a climax of instruments. Right at the end, you also hear the phrases, Attention, Planets of the Solar Federation, we have assumed control, we have assumed control, we have assumed control. And these words, they appear, or according to Pert, he wants the happy ending to the story, as the Elder Ways comes back and destroys the regime of the Solar Federation. Personally, I find this quite a sad ending, because it's, if the protagonist had only managed to hold on for a bit longer, then, you know, he could have been living in his perfect utopia, in his dream world, as it's described in the um, soliloquy. Um, I find it quite a sad ending, actually. But anyway, I've gone into massive detail about this song. What time? About seven, eight, mi eight minutes about this song? Yeah, um, as you can tell, I just love this song and I'm really passionate this song about this song. It's Rush's Magnus Opus and in my opinion it's undisputably their best work and one of Progressive Rock's finest moments. I would say it's my joint favourite Progressive Rock song along with Pink Floyd's Comfortably Numb. I think this song is genius and a true masterpiece. It is like the Mona Lisa of Progressive Rock. It really is. And the thing is, uh, having a song this great and this epic is also a downfall to this album as a whole. Because how can anything compare to it? When we get to track two, A Passage to Bangkok, this this track, you know, it starts out with a nice whiff. Apparently this song's about marijuana, I don't quite get how, but... Anyway, it's a really good song. I mean, obviously it pales in person 2112. But still, it's a really great heavy rush song and includes a really nice solo from Lifeson, um, as well as a pretty catchy chorus. I, you know, I really like this track, actually. Then we get to track three, The Twilight Zone. This is about two episodes of the programme called The Twilight Zone, which were Will the Real Martian Please Stand Up, and that's the first verse of the song, and Stop Over in a Quiet Town is the second verse. Geddy Lee's voice is particularly good on this song, I'd say, and this song it has a really nice groove to it, but a very lacklustre chorus. I don't quite know why they released this as the first single instead of A Passage to Bangkok, but still, it's a nice song, but it's just very album-tracky. Then we get to Lessons, and this starts off acoustically with some electric guitar over the top. The chorus is good, and overall, it's a decent song with some nice guitar work from Lifeson. Then Tears starts off very slowly with lyrics written by Geddy Lee and is very much a soft rock ballad, not typical Rush song by any means. 
It's a nice, gentle song, but has nothing particularly outstanding about it or memorable. And then it ends with something for nothing. Now this starts slow but gets heavier for the chorus and it's more traditional of this heavier era of Rush before they go into the more keyboard dominated sort of great under pressure eras. Now this, it's a great song and you know, I think it has a really nice hard rock riff to it and really good solo, great chorus and overall I think it's a really nice song to end this classic album. But overall I believe this album contains Rush's best song, but I don't think it's their best album, certainly not the best I've heard yet. Um, it certainly does tail off after 2112. I would advise that if you really want to hear the songs after, from A Return to Bank, so from, sorry, from A Passage to Bangkok to Something for Nothing, listen to them without listening to 2112, because trust me, you will enjoy them more. 2112 is just so, so overshadows them because it dominates the first side of the album on vinyl, if I had it on vinyl. Really, that would be quite cool on vinyl, actually. I think it sounded really good. Anyway, um, yeah, it's it's still, they're solid songs. But mainly because of 2112, the song, I'm going to give this album an 8.5 out of 10. Mainly because of the almighty song of 2012. It's just, yeah, so good. And to us, it is a good album overall. Um, so, yeah, this has been The Album Man. Thanks um, for watching. Comment, wait, subscribe, and as usual, long live rock and roll. Well.